Welcome to the next class on variational methods. Uh, this is the class on convex relaxation methods. And so what we'll talk about today is how to convexify variational approaches. The idea is that if you have a cost function that is not convex, uh, then a gradient descent will only lead you to a local minimum, whereas what you're really interested in, of course, is the globally best configuration. The variational methods became popular in the 1980s with the snakes, with the Mamforcha, with the also uh, optical flow algorithms that we'll talk about later in class. And a lot of these energies, actually most of them proposed in the 1980s are non-convex energies. Whereas, uh, and, and the challenge is to find good solutions then. For example, for the snakes, any strong gradient in the image will be a, a give rise to a local minimum to the curve that's going to be attracted to these strong gradients. And, and in practice, it means that you need a user in the loop to actually make these methods work, to initialize the curve appropriately so that the local optimum is really what you want. And it means that you cannot apply these methods in a black box tool. Starting in the mid-2000s, people realized that it, one can actually convexify non-convex approaches, replace the original non-convex formulation by a convex one, and typically one loses global optimality with respect to the original energy, but surprisingly it turned out this is not always the case. There are examples, and we'll discuss them in the following, where you have provably optimal solutions. Um, <clears throat> these are the various parts. I will talk about globally optimal solutions and convexity. We'll start with the two-region segmentation case and then later go to the multi-region segmentation case. Historically, the two-region case was convexified around 2005. The multi-region case was convexified around 2008 uh, for the first time. <coughs> um, to Connect to what we talked about in the last chapter, we talked about level set methods and we saw that by level set methods we can, um, uh, uh, it's okay, thank you, we can, uh, we can replace the curve evolution by uh, estimating an embedding function, the level set function, and we saw that the advantage of these level set representations is that they can have uh, the topology of the curve can change, so if the level set function evolves, we can split and generate multiple curves, uh, um, and as a consequence, we can undergo a whole variety of shapes and segmentations. And so the solution space that is accessible with the level set methods is much larger than with a parametric curve. Nevertheless, these level set methods are non-convex energies and so once we minimize them by gradient descent, we will generally only find locally optimal solutions. And how good these local optima with, are with respect to the global minimum, how far we are from the globally optimal configurations is something that is typically hard to say for the traditional level set approaches. Around 2005, people proposed convexifications, which actually replaced the original non-convex energy with a convex one and then solve that problem optimally, and then from the optimum of the convex problem, try to get back a solution to the original problem. We will start with the two-region segmentation case here. This is the piecewise constant mumford cha model for two regions. So we consider an image plane with some region omega-1 and some complement region, the background, which is omega without omega-1. And what's important here is that omega-1 need not be a connected region. It could have multiple components, so it could be any foreground-background separation. And as you may recall from the chapter on, on the mumford cha energy, the region-based segmentation approaches, the cost functions typically have some data term that is aggregated over omega-1. 
and F2 is aggregated over the complement region, omega without omega 1, and then this here is the term that penalizes the lengths of the boundary separating omega 1 and its complement. The data terms F1 and F2, they can be all sorts of data terms. For example, we saw in the mumford cha and its statistical generalization, if you uh, assume that the intensity in region I it can be represented as a Gaussian distribution with mean mu I and standard deviation sigma I, then this is the the negative logarithm of that Gaussian and this will just be the data term in here, this will be Fi. Uh, of course you can also consider more general color distributions, for example if the foreground doesn't have one dominant color but maybe multiple colors, for example if you want to segment a zebra in, in, in the prairie, then what the typical colors for the zebra are not just black but also white, so black and white, and then you would want some multimodal distribution, so on the space of intensities, if this is the intensity, we might have black here, and white here, <coughs> or, or actually, yeah, and white here, and then we might have a distribution such as this one, so this would be PI of I saying we favor intensities that are near black or near white, everything else is disfavored. And then we would have a very general distribution, uh, Pi, and Fi would in this case as well be just the negative logarithm of Pi. If you don't know the color models, you would estimate segmentation and color models at the same time. If you know them beforehand, because in, you have some supervised setting where you know what object you're tracking, you can actually learn beforehand what are the typical colors of that object, what is its histogram of colors, and then impose that as a data term here. And then all you need to optimize is the region, is the segmentation. And so this is the problem we'll consider here, a problem with fixed color models for object and background. If they're not fixed in practice, people tend to alternate the segmentation and the color model estimation. How to do that jointly uh, in one ideally convex formulation is to some extent still active research. Here's the idea that was proposed by Chan, Isidoglu and Nikolova in 2006, the paper appeared. I first heard about it in 2004 when I was working at UCLA together with uh, Selim Isidoglu who told me about uh, these ideas. The idea is actually uh, surprisingly simple. You want a segmentation into foreground and background, and so what, what you do to represent the segmentation is you don't use a parametric curve, you don't use a level set sign distance function, but you use a binary function, a simple binary function which assigns to each pixel x one of two values. One if it's object, and zero if the pixel is part of the background. And with this, representation u of the segmentation, our cost function looks as follows. The integral over omega 1 can be written as an integral over the entire image plane omega, and then you have f1 times u, because u is 1 if and only if that point is in omega 1. And similarly, the integral over the complement region is just f2 times 1 minus u here because 1 minus u is 1 if and only if you're in the background region. And then the boundary length is nothing but the total variation of that function u. We actually mentioned that uh, at some point before, that the, if you have an indicator function u of some set, then the total variation of u encodes the boundary length. The reason you can see that is that u is constant outside, 0, and it's constant 1 inside, so the gradient is actually 0 in most places, except at the boundary, at the transition between u equals 1 
and u equals zero at this transition the gradient is non-zero in the way that this int its integral is just the length of the boundary it's just the number of points where u changes from zero to one the amazing thing about this cost function is it's convex the total variation the norm is a convex function these are actually linear in u this depends is just linear in u and this is obviously also linear in u so in particular they're convex at that point you might wonder why did people not suggest this idea much earlier because we end up with a convex energy here turns out it's only half the truth you not only need a convex energy to get global minima but the domain of optimization also needs to be convex so that you can actually move around in the optimization domain without constraints here unfortunately this is not the case the set of binary valued functions uh, is not convex uh, you can see that convexity for some set means if you have two functions, u and v, both having binary values, then the convex combinations, so the line connecting them, needs al must also be in the set. But obviously if you have two binary functions, u of x and v of x, and then you take, for example, their weighted aver their, their average, then clearly that function already tends to have values, uh, this function has values in 0, 1, and 1 half, which is if one of them is 1 and the other is 0, you get 1 half. So clearly you see that by doing convex combinations of binary functions, you will generally get non-binary functions. In fact, you will get all sorts of intermediate values between 0 and 1. So what can you do if you have a non-convex problem of this type? You can relax the non-convex problem to a convex one. This is where the term relaxation comes in. It essentially means that you, from your overall optimization problem, you drop those aspects that make it non-convex. To introduce a little terminology, the functions uh, that have a finite total variation are called the space of functions of bounded variation often called BV functions and so this here denotes functions from omega to the interval to uh, the uh, the set 0 1 that have a finite total variation of course the total variation as you see it here uh, it, it actually requires you to be differentiable at least in this notation because we have to apply the gradient here and so strictly speaking total variation doesn't apply at least in this formulation to jump functions functions that are clearly not differentiable but we'll see in a later slide that one can generalize this definition of total variation to apply to discontinuous and jump functions and then Finite total variation for these indicator functions really means that the boundary links separating the region with 1 and the region with 0 has a measurable finite length. Of course, one would say any set has a finite length, but there are pathological cases like the contour set or others where this is not the case. Relaxation, as I said, denotes the fact that you drop certain constraints from the optimization problem. Here, the constraint that we drop is the constraint that you should have binary values, that you only, in principle, only want one or zero. And so what Chan et al. proposed is to allow intermediate values in the interval between zero and one, because this is nothing but the convex hull of the original set. So if your original optimization set was non-convex, then you just include as many functions as needed to make the set convex. And this is the convex hull, and in this case, it is this one. The way to see that is that if you have any binary, any pair of binary functions, then using convex combinations, you can really generate all sorts of values between zero and one. 
and vice versa once you allow all values between 0 and 1 so this set here functions with values in the interval 0 1 that is a convex set in the sense that if you do convex combinations that of functions with values in this interval then the convex combinations will also have values in the interval you will never get above 1 or below 0 and so this then is a fully convex problem which we can solve optimally for example by gradient descent or we'll see in a second uh, uh, in, in a few slides later by more sophisticated algorithms <coughs> so we end up with a real valued labeling so rather than having a hard labeling as 1 and 0 this optimization will give us a soft labeling it will assign to each pixel a value between 0 and 1 which is not really what we wanted we wanted originally a hard labeling so one solution is to get from the optimal soft labeling to a hard labeling just by brute force thresholding so we take our solution u say if this is x in 1d and this is the solution u that the algorithm computed we can threshold that solution at any threshold value theta and then say whatever is below theta we set to 0 whatever is above theta we set to 1 and so we end up with some function that is binary and in fact I will be using this notation one of u star larger theta is functions which are one if u star is larger theta and zero otherwise this is a very handy notation we'll use it more frequently in the coming slides in general this is a binary solution so that's good in general though such a binary solution will not necessarily be the optimum of your original problem because you cannot in an optimization just drop constraints and then somehow heuristically introduce them later on once you've optimized in this case however for the class of functionals we are considering here it turns out that this thresholded version of the relaxed solution is indeed an optimum of the original binary problem this is not always the case but for this class of functionals it's the case in fact the class looks as follows uh, to maybe recap how that relates to the original segmentation problem we said f1 times u plus f2 times 1 minus u plus nu times the total variation dx that was our functional what you can do is you can rewrite this and extract the u and just write f1 minus f2 times u and then you can divide by nu so we have divided by nu times u and then we just uh, we are left with plus nabla u so this is I should say nu times this one and then we have nabla u plus some constant and so in the end we can write this one as f and so we have a functional of the type f times u plus gradient u right and the new in front is it doesn't matter it's a constant parameter we can drop it so the class of functionals that we'll be looking at are of this type f times u plus gradient norm u we optimize them over the real valued functions in the in, uh, uh, in the interval 0 1 and the, this thresholding theorem states that if u star is a global minimum over this larger set of real valued functions then thresholded versions of this u star are global minimizers of the corresponding binary labeling problem and very surprisingly this is true for any threshold between 0 and 1 the round brackets means you exclude the values of 0 and 1 so as long as it's large as 0 and smaller than 1 the thresholding doesn't really make too much sense if, if you take the threshold 1 or 0 essentially it means you consider uh, you get a solution which is 0 everywhere or 1 everywhere this uh, thresholding theorem is surprising maybe one comment beforehand if I threshold 
the real valued solution at different threshold, I get different binary solutions. And you would say, wait a second, how can they be globally optimal? Well, it turns out the cost function is convex, but not strictly convex. And so in principle, you can have multiple solutions. And in fact, all of these thresholded versions are potential solutions. In fact, there is a discussion, there was a discussion in the community whether by taking different thresholds you actually get all possible global optima, and the answer is no. So different thresholds will generally give you different globally optimal solutions. They all have the same energy, but you don't necessarily get all conceivable optimal solutions. Yes, so this is the thresholding theorem. Uh, we'll prove it now. The proof actually makes use of two ingredients. One is the so-called layer cake formula. It says that if I have a function u, let's say here is my function u, u of x, then the value of u at any point x, this is the value u of x, uh, here the interval is 0, 1 again. The value of u at that point x is the same as counting how many layers are there below the function u. So you basically represent your function u as a cake made up of many layers and the value here it corresponds to the number of layers theta such that u is larger than theta. This expression, again, is zero if u is smaller than theta. So you only count the number of levels that are below u, and clearly that is the same as the value of u. And in a somewhat similar way, you can write the total variation as an integral over the total variations for each layer. And this is called the co-area formula. We will not prove this formula. It's a result from geometric measure theory. It essentially means that the total variation for a real valued function u is the same as if you consider this, for example, in x and y, you have a function u, then the total variation amounts to the, the lengths of all these level lines of u integrated over all levels because this expression here the total variation of the this upper level set is nothing but the length of the level line th theta and you sum all these lengths over all levels so these are the two ingredients that we use and using these two ingredients what we can do is we can insert that in here and for the total variation of u in here and what we get is we can rewrite the original energy for any function u as the corresponding energy on these upper level sets. In fact, here is what that looks like. If we insert that expression for u and gradient norm here, uh, so here the layer cake formula, here the co-area formula, then we can see that the energy for any function u is nothing but the energy of its upper level sets. And these are in fact exactly the thresholded versions of that function u. And so the statement that you see here, this equality that we get, says that the energy for any function u is nothing but the energy of its thresholded versions summed over all possible thresholds. And now the thresholding theorem says if u is an optimum of the relaxed problem, then so are its thresholded versions for the binary problem. The reason why the thresholded versions are optimal is very simply because thresholding does not increase the energy. So if I have an optimal configuration, upon thresholding the energy is preserved. This is actually almost, you can almost read it off from this equality. Uh, why is that? Because if, assume u is an optimum, meaning there is no function that has lower energy, and now I'm saying the thresholded versions 
their energy summed up over an interval of lengths one has the same energy this can be the, is the case can only be the case if and only if all thresholded versions have the same energy as you if not if there was one that had say a larger energy then for the equality to to be valid there must be equivalently some that have a smaller energy and this is not possible because then that would imply that U is not an optimum. There cannot be a function with smaller energy. And so the proof actually goes by contradiction. You say assume that there is a threshold value theta zero such that the thresholded version of our relaxed optimum is not optimal. Then, due to cont then that implies that there uh, is not optimal means there is some other binary function one sigma that actually has smaller energy than the, th the thresholded version. If that is the case, then due to continuity, if this is true for theta zero, it will also be true for a whole interval of theta values from theta zero minus epsilon to theta zero plus epsilon. And so this inequality will hold for this whole interval. And then as a consequence, you can show that this entire integral over all thresholded versions that actually makes the energy U star is larger than E of 1 sigma. Why is that? E of 1 sigma we can trivially rewrite as E of 1 sigma times integral to 0, 1. That's just 1. It's a constant here. Then we can pull this into the integral. It's a constant. It doesn't depend on theta, so we can include it in here. And then we know for each individually it's either equal or strictly smaller and so for some values in that interval it's strictly smaller for the others it's at best equal and so overall it's still strictly smaller than this one and that was the energy of the relaxed problem and that's a contradiction why because we assumed that u star was a global minimum meaning we assumed that there is no configuration of lower energy and now this indicates that, uh, that there is an, a configuration of lower energy. In other words, the thresholding theorem has to hold, otherwise U star cannot have been um, a global optimum. So as I said, it's a, the, the, the proof is a little bit technical, a little tricky, but as you see, it's only two or three lines, and the key essence of the proof is really the identity up here, namely the fact that the energy for any function u can be expressed as the sum of energies of these upper level sets. And this is a very powerful insight that you can decompose the energy of u as energies of its thresholded versions and if this is the same this can only this can only be the same if all thresholded versions have the same energy so at least not generally it's not that the, well, I should make that clear it, this, this is not always true. So not all thresholded versions have always the same energy as any function u but if u is a global minimizer then yes because if U is a global minimizer, then, these e, then the thresholded versions cannot have smaller energy. And for this equality, that then implies they must all have the same energy. So this is the thresholding theorem. Maybe some comments. It, uh, it applies to this binary labeling problem. It doesn't generalize to any binary labeling problems, of course. It applies to this class of energies, Fu times uh, plus gradient U, actually a slightly larger class of energies it can be applied to. In fact, there is a lot of active research as we speak on what classes of energies does this extend to. It definitely applies to this class and we'll see generalizations later. But overall, if you consider the entire class of binary labeling problems, any random cost function on a binary labeling, then clearly uh, these are NP-hard problems and uh, it's unlikely that you will get optimal solutions in polynomial time.
And so as you saw, the main ingredient is to decompose the energy as an energy on these upper level sets or the thresholded versions of you. And what, what centrally plays a role here is actually this property of the total variation that you can decompose the total variation into total variations for these upper level sets. Here we see it again, this so-called co-area formula. So the total variation for any real valued function u is nothing but the sum of total variations for its thresholded versions. And that is a very nice property of the total variation and this is one of the many, its many properties that make it so extremely popular in optimization. I should mention at this point, uh, uh, of course, this is a class on variational methods and continuous optimization, but it turns out that in the spatially discrete setting that we briefly touched upon in earlier chapters, the same class of cost functions can be solved in polynomial time by the so-called max flow min cut duality uh, um, uh, as a graph cut problem. And so there exist uh, in the continuous setting these convex formulations and in the discrete setting you have the analog and that is polynomial time solutions. Some comment on, I mentioned the total variation only applies to differentiable functions. Uh, it can actually be generalized uh, to non-differentiable functions and it can be generalized in a way that the problem is also about that actually this definition of total variation that we use so far actually has two problems. The first one is the gradient uh, only works if u is differentiable. So the definition doesn't really make sense in this formulation for non-differentiable u. The second problem is that this energy as a function of u is not differentiable itself because the norm at zero is not differentiable and so you cannot do a gradient descent, strictly speaking, on this expression. And so what is often done in practice is that you replace the gradient by the gradient would be square root of nabla u squared. And then in practice what you often do is you add a little epsilon here. And this is sometimes called TV epsilon of u if you want. And, and, and so the idea being that if this is u and this is TV, this is the TV norm and this slight variation basically means you round off the tip here to make it differentiable. It turns out and this is a very nice insight that you don't need to do that. You can actually work with this exact form of total variation. And the idea is that you introduce so-called dual variables. The idea is, I, I show it here, is that you can rewrite the norm of the gradient as a supremum of Xi times gradient U with a vector field Xi that is bounded by 1. Uh, this is actually not so difficult to see that, right? Gradient u is some vector that points in some direction and now you have a scalar product with some variable xi and you say find the xi that maximizes this expression. Which vector maximizes the scalar product? Obviously a vector that is parallel with nabla u and then as large as possible and the largest possible one has norm one and so it's just the unit vector in gradient direction. So if you set xi nabla u divided by norm nabla u, this maximizes the scalar product. And if you plug that in here, you see you get gradient u squared divided by norm gradient u. So what you're left with is just the norm of the gradient. And so clearly this is the same as that one because the supremum is attained at this value. Of course, this Xi only makes sense if the gradient exists and if it's non-zero, otherwise you can't divide by it. But the nice thing is this expression also makes sense if the gradient itself is zero. Or if u is not, we'll see in a second uh, that this can then allow a generalization for non-differentiable u. In fact, 
the definition of total variation, the way you see it in the math literature, is not the one we've used up to date, this one, but it's actually this one here. It says U divergence xi with a vector field xi constrained to a, con a set k, and that set is just the vector fields with uh, with lengths bounded by one. Why is that the same? Assume that u is differentiable. Then you can do integration by parts, meaning this derivative operator goes over to u. And so we have xi times nabla u. Strictly speaking, we also have the boundary terms, so xi times u on the boundary. But we assume xi is zero on the boundary. So this actually uh, C1C means uh, Xi must be differentiable and it has compact support. It's zero on the boundary. And so if that is the case, we can just do the integration by parts. The boundary terms vanish by construction. And then we see the supremum of Xi with lengths bounded by one of Xi nabla u is nothing but the norm of the gradient, as we saw up here. And so it turns out that this definition of total variation that looks, I admit, admittedly a little more abstract, is actually equivalent to this definition for differentiable functions u. The nice thing about this generalization is it also applies to non-differentiable functions u. So if u is a function, for example, an indicator function of a set that jumps from 0 to 1, that's okay. We don't take a derivative here, right? We take the derivative, this is sometimes called the weak formulation, we take the derivatives on the dual variables. These are by construction differentiable so that we, we, we are allowed to do that. And the nice thing is, so we have an expression for total variation which applies to jump functions, to discontinuous functions, and which is identical to our classical definition if u is differentiable. And the other nice thing is not only that it applies to differentiable functions u, but also that this expression as a function of u is in itself differentiable. So you can easily take the derivative with respect to u here. There is no non-differentiability here. In fact, in terms of the variables u and xi, this is as, as simple as you can get. This is actually linear. It's linear in u, and this is an operator, a linear operator, so the whole expression is also linear in xi. It's, in that sense, it's bilinear. And this formulation of the total variation naturally leads to so-called primal dual algorithms that we'll talk about in, in a second. So we have a primal variable that is our function u, and then we have additionally dual variables xi. And so this is a common trick from optimization that you add additional variables to your problem in order to simplify the problem. So starting with an expression that is non-linear in U and not even differentiable, the introduction of dual variables makes it linear in U and Xi and differentiable. So we have an additional set of variables here. That is the sacrifice we have to pay. But what do we gain? We gain in terms of simplicity of the cost function. And uh, at this point, non-smooth and uh, non-convex optimization are very hot topics. Here we have an aspect of non-smooth optimization, and it is actually through these dual variables that things become smooth and easy, simple. And so at the first glance, this looks like we're complicating things, but in truth it will make the optimization simpler. Here is actually a result that I did want to present. Uh, this is a primal dual algorithm. So we mentioned that we want to minimize this class of energies. And we, by convex relaxation, we allow you to have values in the interval 0, 1. So this is the problem. F times u dx plus tvu. 
And now I introduce this more general notion of the total variation with the supremum of Xi, so we have U plus divergence Xi. But remember, it's actually the same as the classical definition if U is differentiable. If we look at this problem, this is actually bilinear in U. Uh, at least the, the data term is linear in U, uh, and the regularizer is linear in U and in Xi. There is an algorithm that we proposed in 2009 that has become extremely popular for this class of cost functions and for generalizations as well. It's a primal dual algorithm. So what we have here is a primal variable u that lives in this convex set, the functions with values in the interval 0, 1, that have finite total variation. Remember bv is the it means the function has a total variation that is not infinite. And then the dual variable lives in that set K. It's also a convex set. The set K is essentially the unit disk. If you see that here, Xi bounded by one means it's a vector field that lives in the unit disk. So, so this is the vector Xi and its length is less or equal to one. And that's obviously a convex set as well. And so what we do to minimize, to optimize this problem is, you see it's a minimization in the primal variable, a maximization in the dual variable. What we do is we simply alternate minimization and maximization. Minimization means we do a gradient descent in the primal variable. This is what you have in here. So this is the iteration of the gradient descent. We say u at iteration n plus 1 is u n minus the time step tau times the, the gradient. This is the functional gradient. It's not difficult to see, actually, if you take the Euler-Lagrange derivative of f times u plus u divergence xi. This is, as I said, linear in u, so you can read off the derivative is just f plus divergence xi. And similarly, <coughs> you can compute the gradient ascent. That means you go uphill in the dual variable because you're maximizing in the dual variable. And so you, you, you go as, uh, if, if you do integration by parts here, you can move the divergence operator over to the function u. Then you have minus nabla u times xi. And so the the functional gradient is just minus nabla u. And you go in that direction, so you have minus some step size sigma and then nabla u. The only way this differs from standard gradient descent in the primal and gradient ascent in the dual is that we do an extrapolation step that is on the primal variable, this is very much like what we saw in the successive over-relaxation idea, is that if this is your iterate of the primal variable, say un, and then this is the next iterate, un plus 1, so we have un here, un plus 1, then you go a little further in that direction, and this we call, uh, actually you go exactly 1, one step further, so the extrapolation factor is, is 2. So this is called un plus 1 bar. Right, so that is un plus 1, this one here, plus the offset vector that we have here added again, so we end up here. So we do a gradient descent in the primal and then an extrapolation step and then we use that extrapolation value in the update of the dual. And then we iterate that. And what I didn't mention yet is this here, pi k and pi c is just projections onto the respective convex sets c and k. This is to assure if you do a gradient descent that your variables remain in the feasible set. Right. For example, for the dual variable means that you do a gradient step in a certain direction and then you project back onto the nearest point in your set K. Or 
with respect to the function u in your set C. This projection, I think I mentioned it here, is actually quite simple. The convex uh, set with respect to uh, the, f the variable u is just the, the functions with values in the interval 0, 1. And you get that by saying, if u is in the interval 0, 1, I don't have to do anything. If it is larger than 1, I just project it back to 1. And if it's smaller than 0, I project to 0. So in the dual, we have this back projection. And in the primal variable, the values have to be in the interval 0, 1. This is the feasible I I interval. And so as soon as the value is above 1, we set it back to 1. If it's below 1, we set it back to 0. And if it's in the interval, we don't do anything. And so this is actually the projection. If we do that for all points x. It's called clipping. We just clip it back to that interval. And in 2D, it means we project onto the disk. This looks a little bit complicated at first glance. What we do here, you can see it, is if the vector xi has a norm less than 1, then the maximum of 1 in norm xi is 1, and so we divide by 1 here, nothing happens. If the norm is larger than 1, then we divide by its norm, so we get a unit vector in that direction. And so what this expression does is exactly back project onto the nearest point on this, uh, of the disk. So if the point is in the disk, we don't do anything. If it's outside the disk, we project back onto the disk. This is the two cases here. So these are the two back projections that we have here in the gradient descent and in the gradient ascent. Then we have the extrapolation step. And what we could show in the 2009 paper is that this algorithm, if you iterate it in xi and u and u bar, it converges to the global minimum of your energy uh, if the step sizes sigma and tau are sufficiently small. This is a nice result because it's not always easy, even if your problem is convex, to actually show that you can compute the global minimum. Uh, for example, the gradient descent that we mentioned, I said it converges to the global optimum. The question is always, does it do so in a finite number of steps? And in fact, these approaches actually have provable convergence rates as well, so you can say how fast it converges in the worst case towards the optimum. And this is a very nice result. And so in practice, these primal dual algorithms, and this one in particular, tend to be much faster than a naive gradient descent. In addition, as I said, the TV norm in itself, strictly speaking, is not differentiable. Of course, you can make it differentiable by adding this epsilon, but then you're only solving an approximate problem. Whereas these primal dual formulations solve the exact problem, and they solve it in a, in a provably optimal way. So this actually, the paper, uh, we published this in 2009. There is a more detailed follow-up paper uh, by my two uh, co-authors, Pock and Chambol, and uh, so these papers have been cited hundreds of times in, in just a few years since the publication. So they're very popular. They're used frequently for these types of optimization problems. For this class of problems, but also for more general convex optimization problems. This is where I'll stop and where we'll continue next time. Thank you.